I was sitting in a boardroom in southeast Washington, D.C., and the morning meetings were progressing as usual, when all of a sudden, the windows shook. We sent somebody out into the hallway to see what was the matter, and they came back with nothing to report. When the meeting broke for the morning coffee break, I went out into the hallway, and I saw two of my colleagues, and they were hugging, and they were crying. I walked a few steps further, and I saw another one of my colleagues, and she was on the telephone, and she was crying too. Because this was the morning of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. The morning progressed as you and I remember it, the first tower, and then the second tower, and then the news of the plane that went down in a field outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And as the rest of the nation experienced this uh, and watched it on their televisions, my experience was enhanced by a few more senses. Through the open window, we could smell the smoke from the Pentagon that was blowing in a southeasterly direction over the Potomac River near Bowling Air Force Base, near where our offices were located. I could hear the roar of the fighter jets that had taken off from Andrews Air Force Base. I could hear the whir of the helicopters that flew low and fast en route to the district to carry out their combat air patrols. Our offices shared some space with the D.C. Police Academy, and outside my right window, a mere 50 or 60 yards away from where I sat watching the television, I could see D.C.'s finest assembling with their police dogs and their bomb squads and their riot gear, getting ready to deploy somewhere in the district. What you may not remember about that morning is that there was a false report that was issued that said a car bomb had gone off outside the State Department. And this just added to this feeling of fear and chaos and uncertainty of the day. Now, you remember that cell phones didn't work very well on 9-11, and it seemed like our office phones at our office didn't work that well either, so I couldn't get word to my friends and family that I was okay. I was 1,200 miles away from home, and I was 20 years old. And I'll be honest, I was, I was scared. You see, I was in Washington, D.C. as a member of the AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps. And for those of you who don't know, AmeriCorps is a volunteer service program open to young people ages 18 to 24. And you can dedicate a year of your life to service to your community and your country. We were attached to an American Red Cross disaster action team. And for those of you who don't know, the American Red Cross carries out over 94% of their humanitarian efforts with a volunteer workforce. And we were tasked to set up the American Red Cross National Capital Chapter Emergency Response Headquarters in Falls Church, Virginia, just a few miles west of the Pentagon. And once our duties were complete there, we were dispatched to Ground Zero at the Pentagon to work in the south parking lot in an American Red Cross care tent. And the picture that you see on your screen is the exact care tent that we set up in the south parking lot of the Pentagon and worked in in the days following 9-11. You see, in the American Red Cross world, a care tent is a place where an emergency worker can go for a brief respite from the duties that they perform. They can go and get a toothbrush or a towel. They can get a, a Gatorade or a meal and just get away from it all for a minute. You see, because we, as workers at the Ground Zero at the Pentagon, we, we just, we had this unspoken understanding that we were doing something unique. At a time when the entire nation seemingly yearned to give back and contribute to the recovery effort, we knew that those of us at Ground Zero were doing something unique. Now, we didn't wear this as a badge of honor, and we didn't brag about it. We just used this knowledge to propel us to do whatever was necessary to get the job done. Now, I can't remember all of the details of what we did at Ground Zero. I do have some snapshots in my memory, especially from the nighttime. And I can remember seeing the silhouette of an emergency worker emerging from the shadows of the Pentagon. And this guy, he was covered from head to toe in ash and soot and dust and dirt from the work that he was doing. And I can remember watching him approach the southern parking lot and just lay down on the asphalt and use the curb as a pillow to grab what I can only imagine was a few winks of sleep before he had to go back on shift again. I can remember a woman coming to my care tent and as she came up to me and I gave her a, a toothbrush and a towel, she just burst into tears because she said she couldn't remember the last time that she brushed her teeth. You see, because the emergency workers at Ground Zero inside that wreckage, they had to be the consummate professional. 
They had to hold their emotions in check. They couldn't let their emotions get in, a, in the way of their work. So when they came to our care tent, they could just let all of that go. And I got to see the real them. Emergency workers would come up to me and, and they would hug me. Me. Just, I was a total stranger to them, but they would come up to me, they would hug me, and we would cry. And then we would cry, and we would hug. And these emergency workers would maybe grab a sandwich and they would sit down on the asphalt. And they would just sit there in complete silence, staring off into the distance. You see, I was an American Red Cross worker at Ground Zero at the Pentagon in the days following 9-11. I was 20 years old when I saw what I believe was true heroism for the first time. You see, these emergency workers were working around the clock. They were tired and weak and weary and worn. They were running on empty. They were emotionally spent. They were physically drained. But these ordinary citizens were called upon to do extraordinary things. And I saw these men and women stand up and dust themselves off and dry their tears and take a deep breath and turn around and walk right back into that charred black hole in the Pentagon. And folks, they saw things that you and I couldn't even imagine. You know, it wasn't as if we brought in teams of Navy SEALs to save the day. It wasn't as if we brought in NBA All-Stars to come and do the work for us. No. The work that was done at the Pentagon and at the World Trade Center in New York City was done by people that you and I know. This work was done by the policemen that we see at the PTA meeting. It was done by the firefighter that lives in our neighborhood. The people that were called upon to rescue and help the people that are in this picture were the EMT that goes to your church and probably the American Red Cross worker who sits in the cubicle next to you. You see, the theme of today's TEDx conference is challenge accepted. You want a challenge? How about this for a challenge? You know every 9-11 anniversary when you see those bumper stickers and those t-shirts that say something like, 9-11, never forget. How is this for a challenge? How about we transform and translate that from just a mere catchy slogan to a reality? You see, because you said you wouldn't forget. But I believe that we have. You see, I believe that what happens in America every single year is that on the anniversary of 9-11, we honor the heroes, we remember the fallen, we give them their due. But I do believe that for the other 364 days a year, we fall short of the promise that we made to never forget. So how about this for a challenge? How about we as a nation don't go one more day without taking some sort of action to remember and, and honor the sacrifice and show our gratitude for those everyday heroes that live among us. How about you walk on down to the police station and shake the hands of the men and women who keep us safe walking the beat? How about you go home and you bake your best baked goods and you walk on down to the local fire hall and you give some hugs to the men and women who risk their lives for us every single day? Have you walked into a local ambulance garage lately and talked to an EMT and thanked them for literally saving lives on a daily basis? Somebody in this audience probably knows an ER nurse or an ER doctor. Next time you see them, how about you thank them for being there for us when we need them most? The next time you see a man or woman wearing the uniform of our country in our armed services, don't just go up to them and tell them thank you for your service. Get into a conversation with them and tell them thank you for choosing a life full of fewer freedoms so that you and I can enjoy so many. You see, I believe this is the challenge. The challenge is that for the other 364 days a year, to remember and honor those heroes that live among us. I think that that is a challenge worth accepting. Do you remember what happened in America in the days and weeks following 9-11? Do you remember that from Coast to coast, you couldn't find a bridge or overpass that wasn't littered with a sign, a homemade sign that said something like, God bless the USA, or thank you, NYFD. From sea to shining sea, you couldn't find a car antenna that wasn't littered with some sort of red, white, and blue. Old glory flew in more front yards, I believe, since probably World War II and the war effort. 
There was just this outpouring in America, remember? And this was illustrated so beautifully. One day, when I was driving west on Arlington Boulevard from the Pentagon to our American Red Cross headquarters, and I was riding in an American Red Cross emergency response vehicle with my good buddy, Sean D. Kaprevich. He and I were AmeriCorps members and Red Cross volunteers. And we saw on the side of the road a youth group. Now, the the group of, of young people must have been, I don't know, maybe five to 12 years old or so. And they must have found out that this was the route that we were taking back and forth from the Pentagon to the headquarters because they had homemade signs that said, thank you, Red Cross. And they waved us over to the side of the road. And we were, as we got out of the van, Sean and I were wearing our American Red Cross disaster relief vests. And before our feet could hit the ground, this group of young people surrounded us like we were rock stars. And they were shouting, they were shouting, thank you, thank you, thank you, Red Cross. And I can remember distinctly a a young boy, I don't know, maybe he was six or seven years old. And he looks up at me and he points at me and he says, you're my hero. Now, I wasn't the hero. The true heroes were back at Ground Zero at the Pentagon. The true heroes were sifting through the rubble in New York City. I was just simply their representative. But think about what just happened there. In the fall of 2001, somewhere in America, a young boy looked up at a volunteer and said, you're my hero. My name wasn't Justin Bieber. I wasn't Justin Timberlake. I wasn't Beyonce or Miley Cyrus. I wasn't a rock star or a star athlete. I was an American Red Cross volunteer and an AmeriCorps member and a young boy looked up at me and said, you're my hero. Here's my question. Do we live in that America today? You want a challenge? How about this for a challenge? How about we raise an entire generation of young people who look up at our civil servants as heroes? How about we project the policemen and the firefighters and the volunteers and the American Red Cross workers and the military members as heroic to our young people? You want a challenge? How about this for a challenge? How about we redefine what it is to be a hero in America, much in the same way as we did in the days and weeks following 9-11? You see, I think that that is a challenge worth accepting. You see, I was, I was standing, this was years later, I was standing in a seventh grade classroom at Carl Ben Allison Elementary, excuse me, Carl Ben Allison Middle School in Fargo, North Dakota. And I was talking to the seventh graders about the experiences that I had at the Pentagon. And during my presentation, I used a news clipping. Uh, it, you know, it's the news footage that you and I have seen probably a hundred times in our life. And if you're using this video as a a lesson on 9-11 to teach to your classroom, I would encourage you to go out to abcnews.com and find that news clipping. It's just a timeline of events. It's called 9-11 Remembered, How the Day Unfolded. And I showed that five-minute clip of the news footage that you and I have seen so many times. And I was astounded at how many of these seventh graders came up to me after the presentation and said, Mark, I have never seen that footage before. They said they had never seen the planes flying into the, into the World Trade Centers. They had never seen the towers falling. And at first, I was kind of blown away. But then I thought about it, and I thought, well, I've got to give them a break, because think about it. If you're a seventh grader in 2013, you weren't even born on 9-11. You see, there's an entirely new generation of Americans who didn't live through this Kennedy assassination moment of our generation. You see, I wasn't there to teach these seventh graders in this next generation of Americans. I wasn't there to teach them about the change in political climate following 9-11. I wasn't there to teach them about the war on terrorism. They can learn about that stuff in their history books. What I was there to teach them was about the good things that happened after 9-11 in this country. I was there to teach them about how Americans changed in the days and weeks following 9-11. You see, I believe that the best person that you and I have ever been is the person that we were on 9-12-2001. Remember? We called our mother and we told her that we loved her. We hugged our kids really, really tight that night. We had more patience, especially when we traveled. 
We stood in our driveways and had the time to just chat with our neighbor. We called colleagues of ours that we wouldn't normally call just to make sure that they were all right. We gave more as a country. We volunteered more as a nation in the year following 9-11. Remember when we stood in line outside and around the block to give blood because we just wanted to do some small thing to contribute to the recovery effort? You see, I believe that the best person that you or I have ever been is the person that we were on 9-12-2001. So you want a challenge? How about this for a challenge? When you teach the next generation about 9-11, don't just teach them about how America changed. Teach them about how Americans changed. Teach them about how you changed in the days and weeks following 9-11. Teach them about the person you were on 9-12-2001. Because I believe that was the most caring, loving, kind, patient, giving, compassionate person that we have ever been. So my friends, the challenge is to be that person as often as possible. So America, will you accept my challenge? Will you accept my challenge to be that kind, caring, compassionate, loving, giving, patient person as we were on the, that day and the days following 9-11? Because I think that that is a challenge worth accepting. You see, 9-11 is not just another date on the calendar. It's a reminder of who we are as a nation. It's a reminder of who we value as a society. And it's a reminder of how good we can be as people. So you want a challenge? How about this for a challenge? September 11th, 2001. Never forget. Thank you.